Right, morning all. I think we'll, we'll look to make a start. Just to introduce myself very quickly uh, before we begin, I'm Dave George. Um, I'm from Newcastle University. I'm also chair of the Pharma Scientist Network, run through the Yorkshire Agricultural Society, um, which puts on the Innovation Zone. This is the, the second year um, we've had the Innovation Zone, and it's already gone from strength to strength um, from last year. Uh, so it's great that we, we have this here to showcase um, the latest in agri-tech innovation, the latest in ideas, um, things that we think we hope will be coming through um, for the agricultural sector sector soon. Uh, we also host the, the Innovation Awards. We've got some of our um, uh, applicants for the Innovation Awards here in the tent today. So do please make sure after the session you have a chance to have a, a really good look around, both inside um, and outside. One of the great things about the Innovation Zone um, over the last couple of years is that we've been able to host these, these sort of quite interactive um, sessions. We did those mostly, I think, just in the in the afternoons uh, or possibly just in the mornings last year. We've opened that up a lot more this year. This, uh, this these, these seats have been full um, throughout the last couple of days and we will be full for the next couple of days um, as well. So please also make sure you come back for things like our, our tea and tech talks and our pie and policy talks that are on today and tomorrow as well. Uh, what we're here to talk about this morning is climate and the environment building a resilient showground. Um, we've got three um, speakers lined up for you. James Bush, um, there on my left, um, of GSC Greys. Alistair Nixon, CEO of the Yorkshire Agricultural Society, sat on my right there. And Paul Brown um, of Ferris Science, that we work with very closely at Newcastle, good to see you, um, on the far right. So I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm going to pass over um, to those individuals who are going to tell you a bit more about what's happening um, at the showground with regards to those, those natural capital markets. If you've had a chance to have a look around, if you've heard some of the talks in some of the, the other tents, um, that I've been lucky enough to attend over the last over the last couple of days. It's a very exciting time at the moment um, for looking at how we can use our land in more ways and particularly how we can make use of that land to do things like lock up more carbon for us um, to address some of our climate change goals and to increase things like biodiversity and um, to help us address um, declines um, in our biodiversity that we're facing at the moment and also things linked to clean air, clean water. Um, those sorts of objectives, those really big sustainable development goals that we need to work towards um, really as a global population and um, by doing what we can um, with the land that we manage. Uh, so I'm going to pass straight over, I'm going to go and sit myself back down in the middle there um, and I'm going to pass over to James Bush. All right, thank you David. Um, it's fallen on me just to run through what uh, ESG is because uh, obviously the basis that we are working alongside uh, Yas and Ferra is on the ESG strategy um, for Yorkshire Agriculture Society. So I'm just going to touch on it a couple of minutes just to explain what ESG is, because many of you might not know what it is. Uh, I'm then going to hand to Alistair, who will talk a bit about why the show is looking at what we're looking at. And the technology works. That's brilliant. So in terms of what is ESG, um, it's the new CSR, all these acronyms. Do we know what CSR is? Anybody got a clue? Corporate social responsibility. So basically, businesses have a responsibility to look at the environmental and um, sustainability impacts within their business. It usually works on the basis that they're looking at putting together aims and actions to be able to address it. ESG is, I would say, includes CSR in the old form, but it's far more comprehensive than what it looks at. So ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. All key parts of of a business really. Where it's more comprehensive is actually it's not just looking at aims and, and actions that they can take, it's actually looking at a quantifiable measure of that and actually putting together a, a system of being able to monitor it over time and actually help guide a business through it. <coughs> it's, a, it's about accountability, it's used by shareholders and investors, it's used as a way of being able to measure a business's ability to be sustainable. When I talk about sustainability, it's not purely about environmental, which is where CSR is very much focused. It's, it is about being sustainable financially for a long period of time. So from an investor's point of view, it's a key piece of information for them. It's also about risk management. So it's looking at risks and opportunities for a business, non-financial risk non risks and opportunities. So it gives us that basis to be able to look wider of that. Um, when I say opportunities, we're going to touch on it later when we talk about natural capital, which is a, a, a big thing now in the agricultural industry, I think we'll all agree. Um, but it gives us a framework to be able to use to address those going forward. 
and it forms part of the business plan because all of these things have an impact on the bottom line. Um, whilst there's significant amounts of impact, uh, income to be generated, there is also a significant amount of cost associated with a lot of it. This forms part of the business plan going forward. So again, from an investor stakeholder point of view, it's a significant part of what we're planning for the next few years. It is an international effort. Um, as David already alluded to, there's 17 um, sustainable development goals, which are UN goals. And um, every business will look at these 17 goals and choose some that will be focused upon within their strategy going forward in the ESG. You're not going to do everything. We can't do everything. You know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of options there. So there's, you know, uh, life above ground. There's life in water. There's um, it's, it's zero hunger. There's a there's a number of different pillars that they can look at, and you can select so many. There are those that you will achieve. There are those that you want to try and achieve, and there are those that will be aspirational. Um, but that all forms part of the ESG uh, strategy. Um, I've jumped one there, actually. And it's not a one and done process. So although we're going through a process of developing a strategy now, it's not do it, slap it in the drawer and leave it there forevermore. This is a continual process. So as we go on, it will be monitored. The goals will see whether we've achieved any of them, see how far off we are. It might be that things have taken a complete turn and we're having to reassess what our goals are. So it is about, it's a very much a developmental process and continually looking at it and redressing it. Um, so yeah, definitely an ongoing thing. I think I've covered um, ESG at the highest level. I'm going to hand on to Alistair now, who's going to explain a bit about the showground and why we're actually looking at it. Thank you. So good morning. I'm Alistair Nixon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Yorkshire Agricultural Society. Welcome to the Society and welcome to our showground. I hope you have a lovely day here. So uh, let me kick off. Uh, what slide am I on? Right, yes. So the Orchard Agricultural Society, if you did not know, we are the chaps that run the show. We organise the show. We were founded in 1837 and we moved to the Harrogate, uh, our Harrogate location in 1952. Before that, we were what you call a peripatetic show and we moved around all of Yorkshire. So we're in Hull, North Allerton, Leeds, York. Uh, and we cycled round uh, most of Yorkshire. But as I say, since 1952, we've been housed and, uh, and, and built a fantastic showground here in Harrogate. As I said, we are a charity, and these are the objectives of the society. And I think it's important just to talk you through these, because this is why the society exists. So the first is to support and promote agriculture, rural and allied industries, throughout the north of England, including championing the role of farmers as providers of high quality produce and encouraging consumers to choose healthy and local produce. So uh, we do this really through grants, uh, grant funding, we do it through our networks, Future Farmer, Women in Farming, Rural Support Network, uh, Food Farming uh, Rural Network. So, there's a lot of activity in that space, and we are busy all year round uh, in our charitable activity space. Our second objective is to advance and encourage agricultural research and a greater understanding and empathy with farming and the countryside amongst the general public and particularly children. So again, we do this through our educational events, our big ed educational events at the start of the year. We do this through our Farmer Scientist Network, where we sponsor uh, we sponsor a Nuffield Scholar every, every year, which is a life-changing experience for an individual. Uh, we provide bursaries and again grants. So we're, again, we're very active in that space. Where's my slides from? Ah, oh, there we go. Third is to advance and encourage the protection and sustainability of the environment. So that's really where we are and what we're going to talk about today. But that theme underpins everything we do both on the showground and in our charitable activities. It underlines everything we do. And then the fourth is to hold in pursuance of its main objectives an annual agricultural show. And that is the Great Yorkshire Show, which I hope you'll enjoy today. So that's a quick run through of the society, what we're trying to achieve, why we exist. These objectives were set with the 
uh, uh, charity was the first practice did. Going too far. That's not come up. Let me flick back. Can I go back? Right, I'm going back to this slide because I think it leads nicely on to what I want to talk about. So, this is uh, this is an actual photo of 1952. This is what the show gown looked like in 1952. I know it's black and white, but these are green spaces encircling the show gown. So a nice green, 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 surrounded by green. This is the show ground last year. Same, almost from the same angle, maybe slightly higher up. But you can see um, Harrogate, we are right on the edge of Harrogate now. We've got Harrogate coming down the side here, but Harrogate there coming down the side here. So the show ground is, is in its environment is very different to back in 1952. So, um, why is, why is that important? Well, um, I, um, I come from Castle Howard. I've been here two years. Castle Howard, we were um, uh, uh, very uh, keen on our environmental land management. Um, and I looked at this, um, came here two years in, we formed a five-year strategy. And as part of that strategy, we came up with an environmental plan. Now, as a society, we are committed to good environmental practice and land management, and we're also committed to uh, achieving net zero by, by the government target of 2050. So, in order to try and achieve that, we need to look at what can we do from where we are now. And I really looked at the showground in two areas. We have our busy operational showground, which is about 110 acres, and that's where we are now. And then we have our wider land, estate land, land, land area, which is around 230 acres. So all in all, we, we're responsible for 340 acres here. 110 on the showground, 240 outside the showground. Um, so in terms of trying to understand how do we move forward with an environmental action plan, thought the best thing to do was to do a baseline survey to understand where we are. So I split the task up into understanding what our environmental impact is from our operations. So that's really our CO2 impact on the environment. So then I said, well, we need to look at what our carbon sequestration and carbon consumption potential is and our biodiversity of the wider estate, of the 230 acres outside the showground. So we split the task up to, to, uh, to, to, to really look at the two different areas with the idea of netting off these two studies to give us a net effect. And I'm really pleased that end of this year we'll be scope one and scope two net zero, which is, which is a fantastic place to be. Scope three is a very different beast. Uh, to tackle, and that's that's what we uh, need to move forward on. But the, the society does has done a fantastic amount of work. We've got solar panels on our event centre. We've got solar panels on our sheep sheds. We've got ground source heat pump systems, and all of that has helped us manage our scope one and scope two. So, in terms of looking at our carbon sequestration our biodiversity and our carbon consumption, um, we engage FERA, Land 360, to help us with that exercise. Um, and uh, they've given us a, gave us a great starting point for us to then branch, move on from. If I go back to this slide, I think the journey we are on, although we are a showground, is not dissimilar to most landowners. So we have the same pressures as most landowners, of all landowners now. First of all, we have the public access pressure. So currently, we've got five kilometers of bridleways, public footpaths, and progressive routes through our land. We've got the environmental management challenge of managing uh, 340 acres of land. 
And the third thing, whilst we don't, our priority is not food production, our priority is car parking space for the showground. Okay, but it's still a priority. Whatever we do and how we manage the land, we have to bear in mind that the priority of our land ownership is car parking. But for anyone else, you can swip and slip, swap that out for food production. Um, so we've done a fantastic uh, uh, a set of work with Ferris Land 360 solution, which you'll hear about in a minute. We're now working with Grays to take that to the next step to help develop a, a future-proof, sustainable land management plan, which works both with our ongoing needs, but also for the future. Um, and I'm hoping that beyond just benefiting the society and the showground, what we're doing will hopefully inspire other landowners uh, uh, to go on a similar journey. Uh, and hopefully they will benefit from this sort of exercise as well as us. So my hand, hand you over, thank you very much. Okay, right, so I'm Paul Brown from Ferris Science Limited. I'm a remote sensing scientist and geomatic surveyor by trade. Um, Ferra, I don't know whether you know Ferra, but it's a science research organization, the former Food and Environment Research Agency, based just seven miles north of York, just off the A64, one of those big white labs that you can see off just off the road there. Um, but I'm here to talk about Land360. Which screen can I see better? Um, and it, and what it actually is and what the services that we provide. So it's a science-based approach to auditing your natural landscape, basically. And it's understanding the value of the natural capital and helping future-proof your business uh, and land for the future generations. A lot of these nature market contracts are multi-decade contracts. So not to talk about your generation, it's about the next generation and the next generation on. So they're big decisions that need to be made. So what is Land360, it measures, monitors, and assesses habitats and resources to identify tangible natural capital and biodiversity opportunities. It's combining data and science and providing those with the stake in land, the farmers, the, the showground, the estates, um, a view of the different trade-offs between different uses, different decisions, what can I do with my land? And we look at Initially, building a natural capital baseline, as we spoke about baselining, which we've done on the um, showground here, to help make data-led, informative decisions about your land. Again, what are the right decisions to, to make? Achieving net zero targets, um, I was to mention this as well, getting to the scope one, scope two targets, and eventually scope three, through nature-based solutions as a huge help to getting there, and contributing towards nature and environmental recovery, which obviously is extremely important. Um, and help also help your business tap, and, tap into nature-based markets such as BNG, uh, trading units and trading carbon credits. So what is the journey, the Land360 journey for a customer, for a stakeholder? We start at the Mapping Plus, move on to the Scoring Plus, and then the Ecosystem Plus. That's just our marketing terms for the different levels of Land360. Mapping Plus is the baselining, that's what we've conducted on the estate here. Uh, scoring Plus is an ecological survey on the ground. If you're wanting to trade any biodiversity units, currently policy dictates that you have to have an ecological survey on the ground to assess the condition of those habitats. What Mapping Plus does, it does an overview of the whole area and then allows you to identify focus areas that you go and conduct these ecological surveys in rather than doing an ecological survey over the whole of the state. So it's informing those ecological surveys. Ecosystem Plus, every customer, every client, every stakeholder has their individual need, what they want to achieve, and they can be very different. So Ecosystem Plus is like our bespoke consultancy service to help guide that client through the, the journey and the, the noise that is uh, these nature-based markets at the moment and help them inform them to hopefully make the right decisions. So example projects of where we work in Ferra, you know, Ferra 25% owned by DEFRA. So DEFRA are a huge customer of ours. So we work on multiple government projects. The ELMS test and trials are heavily involved in the North York Moors test and trial. They're using spatial modeling uh, of carbon, biodiversity, water, nutrients, um, 
opportunities from public and private funding. You know, how can we stack opportunities to affect change in one area that ticks multiple boxes? Um, the Environment Improvement Plan from DEFRA, they've got biodiversity targets that they want to reach. Um, are the plans in place? We evaluated those plans and are we modelled to see whether they're actually going to reach those targets? So they've been helping DEFRA with that and adjust those plans. And then moving into the private sector, so we, we do all this government work, we do all this UKRI, we work with Innovate UK, we work with NERC, and we do the, the early stage research, and all that translates through to our commercial services. So in the private sector, we're doing a lot of baselining, like we've done here, like we've done at Castle Howard, like we've done for other estates and farm clusters. Um, supply chain impacts on biodiversity for UK major retail retailers, looking at supply chain. Uh, renewable energy companies looking at trade-offs between growing energy crops versus arable rotation versus elms versus BNG, the versus can keep going, you can see the, the, the noise and the decisions that need to be made. Chemical industry looking at ecological connectivity in the landscape, something they're very interested in to increase biodiversity flow. And then also on the flip side, the people who are going to be buying these units, these biodiversity net gain units in the housing sector and working with one of the UK's largest housing developers to see how they can assess which land they will buy and which land they won't and where they can uh, essentially buy units from in the landscape. So what is uh, mapping a detailed baseline uh, for Land 360? How do we do it? How do we go about doing it? It's not an ecological survey on the ground. It's a remote survey. It's all done via a desk. Um, so initially we use Orland Survey Master Map. It's the most detailed mapping we have in the UK provided by Orland Survey. It's what all your maps are based upon. We use that as our initial spatial framework, it's what everything else hangs on. Um, we can stop there, so if we're looking at a huge area of land, like a whole national park, a whole region, a local authority, we can create a habitat map just from that data. It's very quick, very cheap, but it's lacking the detail. You're missing the habitats, the permanent field margins, the individual trees, the hedgerow trees, etc., etc. So what we do is we combine the master map with a very high resolution satellite image, so this is satellite image is actually over Castle Howard. And then we fill in the gaps, basically. We capture the features that are not in master map. And on the, every single one of those features is then attributed to its UK hub attribution. Um, and that is the basis for any further analysis. To do any baselining, any work, you have to have a nice, highly detailed and accurate habitat map. And we get to about 90 to 95% accuracy of an on-the-ground field ecology survey just from the desk space work. So moving on to the showground, what exactly did we do at the showground? So we started off by doing that mapping plus, that, that baselining. Here we can see the, the showground. This is the satellite image that we used for this study, uh, captured actually by this satellite here, Worldview 2. Um, it's a very high resolution satellite imagery, so it's looking 30 centimeter resolution. It's American satellites, that's a foot, a foot resolution. Uh, there we go. And we start off with that habitat mapping, creating that habitat map, using the master map, enhancing that master map, and then assigning the UK HAP classification. Uh, how do we go about assigning that habitat classification? So we use the All and Survey master map that has classes embedded into it. They're not great because it is a national mapping product, so it's not um, you can't solely rely on that. We use interpretation of the satellite imagery. We have expert um, aerial photo interpretation to identify just on the imagery from the ecologist what is the habitat. And we also use multiple ancillary data sets like National Forest Inventory, Environmental Scheme data, and Natural England data to help feed and drive that habitat classification just so we can make it as accurate as possible. Um, and then those habitat classes are then, like I said before, used as the basis for any uh, analysis for BNG and carbon. So that's your nice habitat map with the estate there and the classification. We can move on to the carbon storage map. So this is general baseline overview storage of when this image was captured, what was the store of carbon on this land at that particular point in time? Um, so carbon is, is calculated for each individual parcel. Um, it relates to the amount of carbon contained in the ecosystem, both in vegetation, biomass, and in the soil, estimated in the soil. Uh, woodland has expected it's the largest carbon store on the showground. Let's move on to carbon flux, and this is the probably the most important value and map for achieving that carbon zero. Is it refers to the annual carbon gain or loss from a habitat 
Uh, so a positive carbon flux value represents a carbon loss um, that is stored in that habitat. So an ar arable field that's ploughed extensively and intensively farmed um, oxidizes the soil, carbon is released into the atmosphere, so it is a emitter of that particular habitat. Negative values represent sequestration, so a woodland is growing annually, so it sequesters more carbon over time. So you want to high, the higher the, your negative value, the better the carbon sink of your habitat is. Uh, biodiversity mapping um, is assessment based on the Natural England Biodiversity Metric Tool. Current version is 4.0. Uh, the tool assigns a, a value in biodiversity units um, to areas of habitats and lengths of hedges and watercourses. Um, again, woodland uh, represents the largest contributor to biodiversity, as well as hedgerows. Hedgerows are also a very um, high biodiversity rate in any landscape. And that's the sort of map that, that you get from this uh, product. Obviously, the red areas are your seal surfaces, your buildings, that's pretty lacking biodiversity. And your, your green areas are the, the woodlands and the hedgerows, et cetera, et cetera. So just my last slide, just looking at the headline statistics of the estate. Um, here, um, modified grassland is the largest area, just shy of 90 hectares. Developed land sealed surface is just under 20 hectares, it's your second largest and your third. But still a smaller, much smaller proportion is your lowland mi mixed deciduous woodland. The values, biodiversity value is just under 640 units, so if you're looking at net gain and creating habitat, that's your base value, you want to get above that and then you can trade those units in that gap. Carbon storage is a lot of carbon, 10,000 tons of carbon stored on the site, but it's kind of irrele irrelevant because carbon flux is the sequestration on an annual basis of what's happening on site. So the site is sequestering just under 300 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent on an annual basis. And that is that number that you look at to, to compare with that emissions data and the business um, emissions data that's going on. So say if hypothetically that emissions data is 400 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, your sequestration is 300, you've got 100 gap. And that's the gap you need to fill to, to get to net carbon zero. So with your renewables, with your ground source heat pumps, um, you can bring that emission data down with um, insulation in your buildings. And then creating habitat on the estate, you can bring that sequestration value up and trying to get to that net carbon zero. And again, lowland mixed deciduous sequesters 85.74% of all habitats on the estate, but only covers 17.67 hectares. So you can see that really is sequestering the highest proportion um, of habitats on the, on the Great Yorkshire showground. So yeah, that's, that's me. Oh, right then, so, after all that information we've just had, we've talked about the natural capital potential and what's actually here now. Um, ESG goes much wider than just the natural capital. And the reason that we're looking at along with YAS is actually looking at how all of this would fit into a longer term business plan for the, sh the society and the showground. So we're looking wider of just, nat just the, the natural capital, the BNG, the capital sequestration. We're also looking at the land use and where the most appropriate places are within the showground to actually locate certain certain things so if bng is the thing that we want to do on the showground it's where we locate that to get the most value from it without reducing the value of other parts of the showground that we use for other things so it's a much bigger piece of work the other consideration we talked about business plan and where we're going um yes it is a society it's there for its members the show is the priority but it's also got to be sustainable in its own right so there are things that may come in the future that we may need to have to facilitate on site. So if there was some um, development on the site in terms of other features that we need to expand the showground and make it work better, we may have an obligation for BNG ourselves on here. And in that respect, we would have to deliver that. You wouldn't want to be looking externally if you can deliver it on site. It's the easiest way to do it. Similarly, in terms of generating the carbon. So if, we've, if there's a shortfall in the carbon, you want to be looking to try and deliver that on site. What you don't want to do is stop yourself being able to do other things. So there's other commercial opportunities. It might be some camping or something like that. Who knows? Uh, we're not there yet. We haven't got that far with it. But it's understanding what we're doing with the land now to make sure that there's still opportunity in the future to do those. In terms of how that then relates to farmers and landowners, Alistair was quite right in terms of the use on this, this particular site. Yes, it's not food production as the primary output. But in terms of the land use, there are those key areas, car parking being the one, 
that needs to be here to be able to facilitate the show. It's no different to a farmer having prime land that they don't want to be doing stuff on. It's the productive ground and they're wanting to look at other areas to be able to sort of push potential for BNG, for carbon sequestration. And again, it might not be that they're looking to market the units particularly. They might be using them themselves because, as many of you all know, all businesses are going to have an obligation for carbon going forward. So, you know, you might have that capacity to generate carbon sequestration on the farm. It isn't necessarily about going straight out and selling it. It might be to sit on it and use it for your own purposes. So it's very, very important to farmers and landowners to be addressing this now. They may not go down the route of actually having a formal ESG uh, framework for, for the farm, but most of us are already looking at the environmental opportunities and it's all part of it. That environmental opportunity is going to drive how our business plan goes on the farm. So it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Again, coming back to developers, external developers and other businesses, they can't deliver these things on their own sites. They will be looking to farmers and landowners to pick up the slack. So there's opportunity there. There's marketable opportunity for the sales of these units. Again, this is the whole process. You go through it all, you look at the, your own needs, you look at the business plan for yourselves and how that would work into then the saleable capital items going forward. Where we get involved as agricultural consultants is always just taking a little bit of a step back and saying, actually, this is quite a long commitment. So it's actually understanding what the long-term commitment will be. It might not be for you, it might be the next generation, it could be the next two or three generations. It might be that if you go into a significant um, environmental output um, piece of land through BNG, it might sterilise that land for other things in the future. So it's understanding all of those at the outset to make sure that you're taking the right route. As farmers, we are facing criticism, greenhouse gases, um, you know, it, it's, it's a fairly um, industrial process, the way that we produce food. I'm, you know, I'm not going to convince my words, it is, that's what we do. But we have to have that consideration about what we're doing with the land and how we're managing it. So we want, we're facing criticism, we need to challenge that, we need to, we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best light and actually producing food in the, of the highest quality, but with the highest environmental output as well. The ESG part, obviously looking at setting goals and decision making, we'll sit down and we'll set it out now. We'll understand where we think we want to be in the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. As I said to you earlier, this process is not a do it once and put it to one side. This is a continual process. So whatever decisions we make now, 12 months time or five years time, might not be the right ones. We have to take a different path. Um, I'm going to just move on to the next slide. I'm going to put all these up because it, then we can get it. So in terms of the steps around the SG, um, first point, as Alistair and Paul have both alluded to, is setting the baseline, understanding what you have. Once you have that information, it's then much easier then to put together a business plan and an understanding of what you need to do to get to the next step. Now, ESG is not just about the natural capital elements. Don't forget, it's environmental, social and governance. So the social bit is very much about the interaction with, it can be the local area. No, the showground, as also quite rightly says, is flanked on three sides by Harrogate. It's got access through it. There is, you know, that people use it for other things other than the show. It's an educational facility and that's something that needs to be maximised over time. So all of this plays a part in what we're looking at under the ESG system and actually understanding what we can deliver, how we deliver it, but without detrimentally affecting other parts of what we're doing with the showground. We set the strategy and aims and the objectives and we go out to stakeholders and ask for the input. It's fine setting it in an office sat over there and understanding what we think is needed, but we need to engage other people. So it might be that you go to the wider, wider public in the area. It certainly is something that you would take to your staff. You know, you run it past the staff. They're the people working here. They understand the needs of the showground as well as we do. So it's very much put it through the staff, put it through committee members. We need the input to be able to put a, 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 an achievable structure around this ESG, but something that's going to make the business much more susceptible going forward. Step three is about setting it out and sharing it. So again, we're not going to do all this and then hide it away and say we're going to do this through the back door. This is about saying this is what we're going to do, this is the path we're going to take, 
We won't have all the answers at the start. That will develop over time. But this is where we're setting off. What we've done here is we've actually looked further than just the natural capital elements, and obviously Paul's done that great piece of work looking at where everything is now and what the opportunity is, but the zoning element is what we were talking about, an appropriateness of positioning of certain elements. So where there's commercial opportunity, you can use it. Where there's BNG opportunity or carbon, the biodiversity thing, it might not be BNG, but it could be biodiversity in another way. It could be about social interaction, allowing people into sites. So maybe planting trees and allow people to come and see them, or even get involved in planting them, even better. So that's all part and part and parcel, but that takes quite a bit of work to understand what we can do and where. The next bit is actually about the reporting element. So we've said it, once you've done it, we then need to report against it. We need to understand where we've got to against our goals, where we've got to against what uh, we set out to start. And if we're going in the same direction, because if we're not, from a business plan point of view, we won't be able to manage the cost. We won't understand where the income streams are coming from. So it's all part and a parcel. You set off on a, on a path. If the ESG is saying that we're going this way with environmental, but we're wanting to go that way, we then need to redirect ourselves and bring it back to understand how it's going to affect the, uh, the bottom line. Again, coming back to the farm a bit, it's very much the same. Unfortunately, with farm, farmers, there's so much information to take in at the moment, and we throw another acronym in there, ESG, on top of all the SFI, BPS, and all the other things that they have to do alongside producing the food for us all. As a business, we're involved with Future Farm Resilience Fund, another acronym. Um, it is a free fund available to farmers to actually help them through the process of assessing their businesses. It's not just about environmental output, although we can focus on that, it's very much looking at the whole business and seeing whether we can make that sustainable effort going forward. Um, ultimately, it's fine getting stewardship, it's fine getting BPS, but if the business is reliant on it, we need to be looking at how we can make that more structured going forward and making it sustainable in its own right. Um, and part of that will be having a very low level ESG strategy for each farm, but then obviously tying that into the, like projects such as this, uh, and there will be opportunities out there. So that's a bit of a sales pitch about what we're doing. Um, but it's very much something that every farm should take advantage of. I will say there are 17 companies that are delivering the Future Farmers Resilience Fund across England. The pot's getting smaller and it's all got to be delivered by next March. So if any of you are farmers or no farmers that haven't used it, please encourage them to go and speak to one of the advisors that can deliver it because it really is a useful tool. I think I've covered everything there and I'll hand back to David and we'll uh, see if there's any questions. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much there to all three of our speakers. I found that extraordinarily interesting. My only regret is that I can't see the screen from where I'm sitting, so I think next year I'm going to bring my, my bathroom mirror in from home and put it on the, the three front chairs there. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm going to leverage the fact and take advantage that I'm, I'm chair to ask the first question, then I'll come wandering around with the mic in case anybody else um, wants to ask a question. It's it strikes me that it's a, it, it's a very unique um, case there. I think some of that has come across that you're, you're looking at the, the ESG um, and looking at achieving um, the, the, the multiple benefits that will flow from it on quite unique site, where actually what your, your main crop, if you like, and I look at that from, from my perspective, is, is car parking um, rather than, than yield from wheat or from, or from barley or from, or from livestock. I would imagine that presents some potentially unique challenges and opportunities to either the, 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 the process um, of, of looking at how you generate the right, the right credits for the context of which you're in. Um, but I'd imagine there's also some, some opportunities there. I think particularly that link to education um, at somewhere like the Yorkshire Showground would be a, a fantastic one to be able to implement some of those changes and then and demonstrate those to um, to other stakeholders, but yes, I thought just quickly if you could, if you could, I guess for all three, starting on my left and moving down that way, um, any particular unique challenges and opportunities through this process for the for the Yorkshire Showground? Yeah, I think it is unique in as much as it's a showground as opposed to a farming entity that we would normally deal with. Um, unique because of what it has to, has to deliver in terms of the show and the parking, but in many ways very similar to everything else that we're dealing with. So. Uh, we had the conversation earlier did, that actually the grass, which, you know, we're parking cars on grass, what do you do with the rest of the year? We actually look at the most opportune way of using that. If, we, if we're 
if we're looking at sustainable farming incentive for argument's sake, there are options that are far more forgiving for the use of car parking than others. So where you might benefit from having some livestock grazing on it by putting a herbal layer of clover in for argument's sake, that's not going to work for the practicality of using it as a car park. So yeah, very unique in terms of that, in that respect, but actually quite similar to, to other farming enterprises that we deal with. Yeah, um, I think I think the society is in a is in a fantastic place and position in the fact that we have a, a a very busy showground which is very operational, but then we do have this opportunity with our wider land ownership um, to look at ways that we can uh, uh, minimise that environmental impact ourselves internally. Uh, and really ach achieve that net zero two by 250 um, really by ourselves with what we've got. I think that the, there is so much opportunity, and you're right, there is this uh, uh, fantastic thing where we, we can merge objectives such as our educational piece with our with our biodiversity challenge. So there's, there's a, a, a fantastic amount of opportunity for us as a society. I think the challenge for us is one, not to get overexcited about things because we have to deliver on our core objectives of the society. If we don't deliver on those core objectives of the Ogden Society, which is one, which is holding the Great Walter Show, if we don't achieve that, then we're not achieving what we are need to be as a business. And the other thing is, is these decisions are for the long term, so it takes uh, needs to be properly planned, a lot of thought into it. Um, and not, get, as I say, get overexcited and jump in. Excellent. So yeah, I think the great thing about working on this project was it's all internal and they're wanting to offset all the carbon. They're not wanting to buy credits or anything from anybody else. They want to be open, transparent, and get to that net carbon zero uh, figure. Um, I think the social side um, is really important, is getting the community involved. Uh, I love the idea of the tree planting and getting the community. I did that when I was a kid and I now see that as a forest and it, it is a still thing, thing that stays with me. So getting that community involved is a huge opportunity here. Um, and looking at different, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but looking at different uses of that car parking area when it isn't car parking area, no, it's for this week of the year. So what can we do? What can we, what different things can we sow to try and sequest more carbon in the soil? You know, that, that is a challenge, but it's things we need to look at. And then also looking at uh, connectivity um, in the landscape. There's woodlands that, that there's not just buildings that border the, the estate, there's woodlands and stuff and connectivity, connecting that biodiversity through that landscape and trying to increase those biodiversity flows. Because you change a habitat, the, you'll be surprised how quickly the nature comes in, like the flora and your fauna. The, the placement of some of those things, I suppose, is just as important as, as, as what you're putting in. Yeah, yeah, the placement is hugely important. Like we did it, we've done a huge project for local authorities actually modeling um, tree planting to increase that connectivity. So that those movements, those flows of biodiversity through the landscape just basically just speeds up uh, your, your increase in biodiversity. Fantastic, right? I shall try and wander off without tripping over the table and nose diving into the Good luck. stairs. <laughs> Not the most elegant, especially especially with the suit on. I'm not used to wearing a suit. <laughs> right, I've made it successfully. Has anybody got any questions they would like to ask to our panel? Uh, Paul, uh, I was really interested in your presentation and lots of interesting data and, and, and information. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was you, you said that the soil carbon is being estimated, yeah. and obviously yeah. the amount of carbon on this estate probably the most of it is actually going to be in the soil and yes. probably on the grasslands. So the accuracy of those estimates and how those estimates are derived and the uncertainty factors with those must be quite a set of issues. And I wonder if you could just explore a bit further with us how you've got the data the values that you've come up to for yes. those and in, and in particular how you've estimated that, yeah. to what depth and thinking about the future potentials they will be defined by the stocks that are there so the uncertainty factors then become quite important so maybe if you could just comment on that yeah i'm glad you brought that up it's it's, it's the one uh, thing that does get brought up because it is and i did stop during my presentation and make sure i said the word estimate um because it is the uncertainty the statistical uncertainty in those estimate is 
will be quite large, but it's an overview. It's a, it's a first pass. It's what you can do by a desk based assessment. The, there are, and it's all habitat based. So it's like, we're looking at what's above ground to interpret what's below ground. So it increases uncertainty. There are natural England tools that allow you to do that. And we use those natural England tools, like the biodiversity metric tool, it's a standard. So we use a natural England tool. There's not a lot of standards in carbon, as you probably well know. Um, so the problem with that, it aggregates a lot of habitats into certain single classes. Um, so again, increasing uncertainty. So we try and bring those classes out a little bit. So we go to the academic literature, look at the carbon calculators that we think are most relevant to our study. Um, we're very transparent and open about that in our reports, what we're using. We have to use a 15 centimetre soil depth because it's the depth that, that we can only use across all habitats from a desk-based study. We have to do that. But again, it's the first pass. What we do do with Plan360, a lot of farmers, a lot of estate owners will have soil sample data. So we can bring that soil sample data into that first pass and slowly decrease those levels of uncertainty. Um, the scoring plus aspect of Land360 can be a soil science aspect as well. We can go and core sample every single one of those habitats. The more data we can get, the lower your uncertainty becomes. The first pass is an overview. It's like, right, I, I, I want to know what's going on. What's the estimates of biodiversity? What's the estimates of carbon? Where's going to be the most influential areas I can do things on? Those areas, right, I need to now study these areas in more depth and get some more data. Because the more data you have, the more reliable your results come. But it's, we use what we can to make an effective, informed first pass. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. And last year here in the Innovation Zone, we had a company called AgriSan, where we were looking at, at how you can manage um, and monitor and baseline um, biodiversity, things like insect activity um, in a field. And they were actually developing technology that would listen to the wing beat frequencies of insects within a two meter radius um, of their system um, so that you could get, uh, again, try, trying to continuously improve um, how accurately we can we can monitor those sorts of things. We're doing a little bit of that at Newcastle as well, looking at sensors that we can put into the soil with 5G networks um, to do soil parameters like carbon. Some of that's on show at the back there. Shameless plug from my own university. <laughs> and we've also we've also got all the other great things that Sheffield and Leeds are doing yeah, at the back corner with soils too. <laughs> and Harper, who are also wonderful, are just across there. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, one minute. Thank you. Um, with this, the scope three, and this is, I don't know if anybody else, but trying to understand how we're recording the scope three and how far beyond the farm. So, for example, I'm assuming there's a lot of forage taken off, off the car parking, for want of a better word, and to what extent is how that is then utilised, included in the understanding of the scope three for the site, or is it not? Probably, probably one for me. So, so our biggest scope three impact is is the logistics of transportation of the livestock on and off the showground, of the logistics of trade stands to our events. That that's our big uh, footprint, and and. Um, We've just started on the journey, so it, the, the number is massive uh, and it's it's not going to be easy for, for us to tackle it. Uh, but uh, it, as I say, scope one and scope two, we feel we've got a plan for scope three is is, is the next stage. And it's, yeah, it, as you can imagine, for a show of this size and this complexity, it is it is a huge, it's a huge number. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else? No, I suppose I'll have. I've got one final question before we uh, before we wrap up. Then I, I guess you, you mentioned that there's potentially flexibility to review what you're doing while you're doing it, and then possibly change things moving forward. Um, so it sounds like we're not necessarily fixed in terms of if you if you say this is what we want to start doing, uh, our initial aims, for example, at the start, they would they can be reviewed as part of this process going forward, and and and, and sort of based, I guess based on what's what's going well where. Where new priorities might emerge, things can be changed. Yeah, it, 
and it is actually it's very much about that whole reviewing process and 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 you know taking taking a change of direction if it's required that's actually probably the the, the key part of esg is it's not a, a one-off that's where we're setting to and that's where we're going to try and end up i think you know if you, if you think of it in the context of bigger business where esg is being used for an investor tool and a shareholder tool it's to put that security in the in the sustainability of that business and i said not just environmentally but financially so yeah it is very much a process of review report and change direction if it's required um but you know that's a continual process year on year fantastic well if there are no further questions i'd just like to to thank all of our panelists and thank you for attending um, and just a reminder that we do have our our next tea and text uh, session at 11 15 uh, which will be looking at harvesting tomorrow's energy tips for farm fuel efficiency um, going forward. Um, so one final round of applause. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the show and fingers crossed we'll all stay completely dry for the rest of the day. <laughs>